please open to Nehemiah chapter 13, and also if you will go to 2 Chronicles in the last chapter. Nehemiah chapter 13, and uh, 2 Chronicles. Just share the mess this evening, and get myself together on it. Chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles, if I didn't say that. Okay. I'm going to read uh, verse 15 of Nehemiah uh, chapter 13, and then, then we'll just pray and get right into the message this evening. It's really a simple message. It's, uh, it really makes uh, one solid point and it just has some practical application that reflects the character and nature of God. And it's something that you and I will be able to, I believe, take home with us. So here we are, chapter 13 of Nehemiah, verse 15. The Bible says, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves, and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold Victuals. Well, let's pray. We'll ask the Lord's help with our understanding of the Scripture and our application of tonight for both those things, shall we? God, tonight, I ask that you would open our minds and our hearts. Help us not to approach the teaching of your Word tonight with preconceptions or notions, but with sincere hearts to know your heart. And so I pray that because of that, that you will grant to us as well ways that we could live out the truth that we'll see in the text tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this really is a major insight into how vigilant we as believers ought to be to make sure that we don't just fall back into the things that we're delivered from. And that's what this passage is really mentioning as Nehemiah closes things out. Nehemiah, if you wanted to summarize the book, Nehemiah, of course, is really a portion of the Scripture that's written of one man's testimony of how God used him for the nation to be revived. I mean, this Sunday morning our men sang this song, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, uh, then will I uh, hear... Let's see. Well, I'm messing it up. Second. <laughs> yeah, so, quote it for me, Charlie. My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land? No, will forgive their sins. Forgive their sins and will heal their land. Okay, so that's what the, Nehemiah literally is that. Uh, I remember being in Bible college and even in seminary and having guys split hairs about, you know, that's a verse that's for Israel. You know, that is a promise to Israel. Well, it certainly is. I, I, don't, I hope no one this evening debates whether that's true or not, but my friend, it has to do with what God wants from people that aren't what they ought to be or aren't what they're supposed to be. And so that's literally what Nehemiah is. When I ask the question, what is the need today? And I'm asking it broadly. What is the need in the church? What's the need in the family? What's the need in our country? What's the need around the world? If you just want to ask the question, what's the need today? And you were to be specifics and you're talking about spiritual things and you'll be speaking of spiritual people, we need revival. We need for God's people to be revived or to be renewed, restored again. And we saw with this example, beginning with Nehemiah, that it really takes one person in order for people to have revival. Uh, you have no one to blame for coldness but yourself. If you recognize, I got up this morning and my relationship with God, God was far from me, my heart was cold to spiritual things. I don't have the fresh anointing of the Spirit of God in my life. If you got up this morning and you realized I'm numb or I'm distant or I'm cold, the only person you can blame for that is yourself. So many times we as believers 
you know, we'll get into these corporate prayers where we're begging God to do something on a corporate level. God would just speak to the heart of all the Christians and all the fathers and all the husbands and all the whatever. You know, we need to pray for our category first. And not just pray for our category first, but do business with our category first. And so how do we do that? Well, we look at what the Scripture says about us, we acknowledge it and we humble ourselves, and we turn from our wicked ways, and we seek God's face, and God hears us. And that's the reality. My friend, David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You say, well, that was for David. That's for me too, my friend. And so if I listen to what God says about me, about my sin, about the things in my life that are a hindrance, I can have individual revival at any time. I literally can have individual revival to the great extent that God will actually use my life like one who is in revival. Nehemiah was a great example. One of the things we said early on when we looked at Nehemiah's example that Nehemiah went to Jerusalem, ultimately was appointed as governor of Judah, but Nehemiah went to Jerusalem for the purpose of doing what? Rebuilding the city. Rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the gates, rebuilding the city. And if no one had helped him, Nehemiah, I believe, would have just done it himself. So many times we're waiting for someone to start something, aren't we? Boy, God, give us revival. I want to go to church that's having revival. Where the people are excited about spiritual things. And uh, where people are... are are uh, concerned about spiritual matters. I want to go to church like that. My friend, you ought to want to live in a body like that. And you can. You, know, you can affect change around you, and that's precisely what Nehemiah did. Love of the way that Nehemiah got up in the night and he told no man what he was doing. And he went and surveyed the gates of the city. At one point, it was so bad that he could not ride on his beast of burden, he had to get off and walk. And after he saw how bad the city was, then he told the people, this is bad for the testimony of God. And we ought to do something about it. And then he told them, the king has issued letters giving me. We have access to the materials to build. We have these things. And they said, let's rise up and build. And they strengthened their hands to do the work. How did it come to the place where the people strengthened their hands to do the work? One man said, you know, something the work needs to get done. I'm going to do it. We have churches full of blame-shifting shirkers that literally know what's wrong with everybody else, but we're not what we ought to be as individuals. And if you want to see revival, no one's stopping you, my friend. You say, well, you know, we need better leadership. We'll be a better leader. We'll have better leadership. Honestly. Do you know if God makes you a great leader... People will follow. You need better leadership. Be a better leader. So many times we look around and we see all the problems with everything that we're not responsible for and we forget that we're not responsible for the problems we're not responsible for. So let's deal with ourselves. That's Nehemiah. That's what he did. Consequently, we saw that the walls were rebuilt. There was a revival. The, the law was found. The Scripture was found. Ezra stood up on a pulpit and preached. They were taught, he read the Word of God. They gave the sense of it. And the people were broken hearted about it. And they got back to where they should have been because when they read about the Feast of the Booths, they realized that from the time that Joshua died, that feast had not been kept. And what did they do? They kept the feast. Literally, they said, this has not been done since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, we're going to do it. And individuals decided we're going to do what's right regardless of what anyone before us has done. What an encouraging thing. Nehemiah was away for a while. He comes back and he finds out. <laughs> he finds out that living in the temple actually was Tobiah. Remember right at the beginning we saw the opposition between Sanballat and Tobiah? Nehemiah comes back and in one of the storage areas in the temple itself where the victuals and the things that were supposed to be given to take care of the priests, the Levites, 
instead of the things that belonged in there, instead was the adversary who'd opposed the rebuilding, Tobiah. This guy was supposed to have no part in God's work because he'd mocked it and he'd opposed it. And he's in the temple itself and Nehemiah threw him out. Jesus wasn't the first person to clean out a temple. And so Nehemiah dealt with that. So I want to say that, my friend, we can see revival, but that does not mean that we won't turn away or we won't forget. One of the most important aspects about a person who wants to see revival is that you make sure that you don't go back to what you were before you had revival. And that's precisely what we see in our text this evening. It's where we find ourselves in verse, six, verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and let's just look at uh, and let's just look at the king, the chronicles of the kings and let's look at specifically some of the information about the captivity. Uh, if you were to look at verse 11 in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, you'd see Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Uh, and then it says in verse 14, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and of the people transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Don't you love that verse? Why does God send prophets to warn sinners of their wicked way? Because God has compassion. In other words, God's purpose in sending the prophets wasn't just gloom and doom, you're wrong. It was get right. You can be right, I'll be merciful to you. Verse 16, But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. That, that point will come, my friend. Uh, Pastor, when is it that you you've have gone past the point of no return? Well, when God says so. But Israel had done that before. And uh, the Bible says in verse 17, Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maid, an old man, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the kings and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. Look at verse 21. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now we won't read it tonight, but if you were to read Jeremiah 25, you would see what Jeremiah told the king was the was going to happen because of the rebellion. That is, King Zedekiah. Uh, you would read what Jer Jeremiah had told King Zedekiah and that there was prophesied uh, that there would be 70 years of captivity and the 70 years of captivity was because one in every seven years the land was supposed to have a Sabbath or supposed to have a rest. And so if you want to ask the specific question about why the children of Israel went into captivity, it was so the land could have a Sabbath. And so we find that, uh, and by the way, the scripture doesn't mention that as the only thing. Uh, it mentions worshiping God. It mentions worshiping idols. But the Sabbath is one of the ways that encapsulates that attitude, that unwillingness to give God His. And so God took His 70 year Sabbath by, by expelling the people from the land and making the land rest for 70 years. The land had its Sabbath. So then how important must the Sabbath be to God? <laughs> Some importance, a great deal of importance, or utmost importance. You give me, the, give me the superlative or comparative term. Some, a great deal, or of utmost. How important was the Sabbath to God? It's of utmost importance. It was so important that God said, the land is going to get its rest. So Nehemiah <laughs> notices, back to chapter 13 of Nehemiah verse 15, he notices in Judah, in those days I saw I in Judah 
some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. <laughs> Pastor, are you going to preach legalism? No. Let me just qualify a couple of things this evening. First of all, the Sabbath and the Lord's Day are not the same day of the week, right? What day is the Sabbath? What number is the, is the Sabbath day? Sabbath. Sabbath. What, what number is the Lord's Day? First. The first, okay? So the Sabbath, we would call the Shabbat would be on our beginning, I guess, Friday evening and on Saturday for us. The Lord's Day would begin Sunday morning, wouldn't it? So there's a difference, isn't there, between the Lord's Day and the Sabbath? We, we acknowledge that, correct? You know the difference between the two? Okay, so this evening, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not preaching the mixed theology that a lot of Christians preach. Matter of fact, I think, let me check here. I may have a bulletin in my Bible. Oh, no, it's right here. Oh, look at this. <laughs> this, this. This is coincidental. It just came to my mind. Okay, here's a bulletin from a church that I visited while on vacation a couple weeks ago. Genesis 2-3. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. And this was on a bulletin on Sunday on the first day of the week. Okay, so it is rather rampant, isn't it, in, in uh, uh, the church that people confuse the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. And it's a dangerous theology, actually. If you take it as far as it logically goes, you become a Seventh-day Adventist. And the New Testament of the Scripture actually rebukes all of the things that the Seventh-day Adventists hold to, does it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you read Colossians, uh, you would see that we're not supposed to be worshiping holy days or new moons or Sabbaths. If you read 1 Timothy, uh, you would see that there are commands specifically against uh, making something out of particular days instead of worshiping God. We don't worship the Sabbath. And uh, we don't even, in our church, we don't even really keep the Sabbath because we're not Israel. But how important was the Sabbath to God? There are a lot of people, aren't there, that <laughs> have bad, bad theology about worship because of the Sabbath. It's kind of confusing if you mix the Sabbath and, and the Lord's Day, isn't it? Do you know whether you, to, you should go to church or whether you should just stay home and do nothing? I've met Christians that are like, Pastor, it's, Sunday's supposed to be a day of rest. You're working me to death. I can't work the bus ministry. I can't do uh, the things on the Lord's Day. Because, you know, you're, you know, it's Sabbath's supposed to be a day of rest. Yeah, it is. So take your Sabbath day and come worship the Lord on Sunday. Worship uh, is not rest. You say, Pastor, they worship God on the Sabbath day. Yeah, they did. I, I, I'm not arguing that they didn't worship, but one of the major ways they worshiped God was giving Him the Sabbath. But the Lord's Day is a different day. Okay, so I think I qualified by saying I'm not saying that the two are the same. Does everybody understand that? Are we all on the same page? I'm not preaching that the Sabbath and the Lord's Day are the same. They're different. They're distinctly different. Now, so here we are. And Nehemiah, in verse 15, has seen that there are people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and ladies' asses. I think it was my dad. I hope he hears this. Uh, <laughs> I think it was my dad that told me or mentioned that, you know, farmers got to, you, know, uh, you know, sometimes during harvest time they have to miss some church because they got to get the harvest in. Well, <laughs> if... if uh, if you're treating it like the Sabbath day, you, you just have to trust God for the harvest. That's the idea here. In other words, here are people who are treading out the wine press. Now, why would somebody be treading out the wine press on the Sabbath day? Why would they do that? I can think of two practical reasons. You tell me what they might be. Okay, that, that would be reading all the way into the motive behind. Practically speaking, why would they do it? What do you think, Mrs. Dawes? Um, because if they don't get it in in time and it rains, it will destroy the harvest. Yeah, so the harvest, so the grapes could spoil if you don't tread them out in time. Could that happen? How long does it take grapes to spoil? Under the right conditions, <laughs> about a day, right? So what's going to keep the grapes from spoiling Finish if you don't the tread them out? What? Finish the job. Okay, you could either finish the job or God could. Uh, I'm reminded of the children of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness. I'm reminded about their sandals. You remember that? 
Remember their clothing, their sandals? Their sandals never wore out and they walked on them for 40 years. I would love a pair of those. <laughs> I am brutal on footwear. Last Monday, I blew up a pair of shoes. I mean, blew them up, not, not with explosions. But my foot came there, a pair, don't buy Timberlands. Timberland, here's an official um, negative, whatever you want to call it, blurb against Timberland. I've never had a good pair of Timberland shoes. They do a great job with uh, marketing. They have very nice looking stores. They have very good looking shoes, but they're extremely uncomfortable. They have terrible soles, and they blow apart. I'm seriously. The other day, I was climbing a tree in my Timberlands. You say, you're not supposed to climb trees in Timberlands. Well, maybe not, but if I didn't want to climb a tree and I got shoes on, I'm going to do it. Okay, so I was climbing a tree with a chainsaw, with my chainsaw running, and my foot came through, the, the sole just came off of my Timberlands, just came completely off. And I looked down and my sole was coming off my other pair of Timberlands. And they had very little wear on them, uh, mostly because I don't wear them very often because they're not comfortable shoes. So Timberlands are terrible. It has nothing to do with the service deceiving. I just want to say it so everybody knows, don't buy Timberlands. And if Timberland would like to call and apologize to me for making a terrible shoe <laughs> and uh, causing me frustration in life, they were better shoes after I duct taped them together. So if you'd like a, if you'd like a better pair of Timberlands, or a better pair of shoes than Timberlands, wrap your shoes in newspaper and, and then just put duct tape on them, and you'll have a pair of shoes that are far better fitting, more comfortable, and definitely more durable than Timberlands, which are supposed to be very durable and waterproof and all that, and they're junk. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to have a pair of the sandals that the children of Israel had when they wandered in the wilderness because they lasted 40 years and didn't wear out. You remember reading that in the scripture? That's pretty amazing. Who made the sandals not wear out? Lord. God did. I wish I'd prayed about my Timberlands. Because <laughs> 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 it cost me about 15 minutes trying to find duct tape. <laughs> so, uh, so, who could keep the grapes from spoiling if you trusted God on the Sabbath day? Serious. If God wants you not to tread out the wine press on the Sabbath day, do you think do you think that He could make circumstances so that you wouldn't have to? It might be that if you have so many grapes that you've got to toil on the Sabbath day that maybe you have more grapes than what God wants you to have. I'm not trying to be hyper spiritual, my friend, but the Sabbath day is the Sabbath day, and God's command to rest on the Sabbath day was so important that the people went into captivity so the land could have its rest. And Nehemiah saw it, and he was outraged. He was shocked. And if you'll think uh, with Nehemiah, why was he shocked? Look at verse 17. He said, Then I can, by the way, it was also the men that bought and sold. They were buying and selling on the Sabbath day as well. And he testified against it. Verse 17, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and, I, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Verse 18, Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Now you say, Pastor, I don't agree that the people went into bondage because of the Sabbath. Well, you're going to have to argue with Nehemiah, who was allowed to pen these words with the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So if you don't like it, take it up with God. <laughs> Nehemiah said, we've had all this trouble for working on the Sabbath day, and what are you guys doing? <laughs> Parents, have you ever done this? you ever just like had a mess because some, you know, your kids did something a certain way and then they went and did the thing? The same thing that caused all the problems they were doing again? Man, it's a tough thing for an employer. Man, you ever have an employee that does something wrong and it just causes a sticking point? And then you go and you get everything fixed again, then you find somebody doing the same thing that caused the problem to begin with. It's like, stop it! Nehemiah said, we ended up in a mess because of not keeping the Sabbath day. And what are you doing? What are you doing? My friend, if we are to maintain revival, we've said that all it takes to have revival is for one person to just simply... Get right with God. Anybody can have revival. We have God's permission for it. We don't have to wait and say, God, you know, we're just praying that you'll just do something and then we just wait for God to do it. No, we can just get right and have revival. We can just obey God and have God's blessing. One of the things we must do if we are to remain in a state of revival is to not go back to where we were before. 
tra it's tragic, isn't it? How many Christians who are delivered from something go back to the thing they're delivered from? You know, I think sometimes it's individual circumstances that people want to be delivered from. They don't want to be changed. It's amazing how many times God will deliver an individual from something. And the Bible says, as a dog returneth unto his vomit, even so a fool to his folly. And these individuals, if you want to summarize why it is that they're working on the Sabbath, I don't believe that they were afraid their graves would spoil. I believe it was just pure greed. They saw a chance to take something that belonged to God and they have it for themselves. Who's, who was the Sabbath for? Well, Jesus said the Sabbath was for man. Who did the Sabbath honor? It honored God. And by not keeping of the Sabbath, these same individuals were able to keep for themselves what belonged to God. See, in Israel prior to the captivity, every year that the land was supposed to be set aside for a Sabbath year, every year that they didn't set it aside, they took the profit from it, didn't they? And so God got His, he got his years back. He got 70 back. 490 years, they didn't keep the Sabbath. God got it back. This is interesting. This is not meant to be scientific. It's just an observation. Um, my granddad used to practice Sabbaths with his field because it was just a good farming practice. It was actually just a good technique for farming. Uh, he would take a different field uh, every few years and, and let it just set. Volunteer wheat or whatever had been grown. Maybe it was uh, milo or maybe it was uh, soybeans. But he would just let the field sit and not plant it. And the year after that, man, we would just have a bumper crop. It, it was good for the land to have a rest, to rest the land for the Sabbath. God's not a fool. God made the earth, and he probably knows a little bit about good farming technique. And he wanted Israel to have a Sabbath because he wanted to bless them. It's hard to bless someone that won't listen to you that won't do what's necessary in order to be blessed. And I have to say to you that God could easily in the six years make up the difference for what would have been harvested in the seventh year with the added benefit that you'd get a year off. The Sabbath is a great deal, actually. The Sabbath was a promise to God, from God, that you could do less and reap more. I like things like that, don't you? I don't know about you, but if God tells me, take a day off and I'll make sure that you have things just like you had. not I'll make sure you're taken care of just like you haven't taken a day off. I'll take the day off. That is, if I believe God, if I trust God. So ultimately, what was the problem here with these individuals? They didn't trust God. They didn't trust God. My friend, that will lead you into world problems. You see, this manifests itself a lot of different ways, doesn't the believer? I know Christians that don't believe God about finances. They don't believe God about debt. They don't believe God about faithfulness. They just don't trust God. You say, you know, you know the Bible says to borrow a servant to the lender. And the Bible says, owe no man anything. Might be a good idea to pay attention to that. Might be a good idea. I know Christians, well, you know, Pastor, I could, I had people tell me, I couldn't drive a car like you drive. Well, I know you're not a good driver. You know, <laughs> no, um, you know, you probably could drive a car like you drove if you had the same God taking care of you that I did. You say, well, Pastor, but you know how to fix your car. Yeah, I learned how to fix my car. So could anybody, actually, you know. Uh, <laughs> I just thought uh, of how many, okay, so my wife and I have been married for 16 years. I'm right about that, aren't I? Yeah, 16 years. You know how many, if we went on the five-year car plan, most people trade in their car about every five years. A lot of people do. Most of you guys don't. <laughs> but a lot of people trade in their car every five years. We'd have been through three brand new cars in the time we've been married. We've killed a lot of old cars, but we've never bought a new car. We've never had new debt. You know how old my first car would be if I bought a car when we first got married? 15 years old. It'd be older than my cars. 
You know, so what's the point? Well, my point is, is that somehow I survived without buying new cars. Not impressed by them because why? Because God will get me from point A to point B if I need one and need to. Um, as a church, I have never said we'll never borrow money, but I've never felt okay borrowing money for our church. And you know, God's taking care of us. I've prayed and said, God, I, I believe the scripture I teach us that we ought to be debt free. We want to honor you by being debt free. Would you take care of our needs? And God always has. You know, I have pastor friends who don't subscribe to that. They think you can't do anything without debt. You can't grow without debt. You can't whatever. And they have higher stress levels than I do by quite a great deal. Because God just doesn't do the nice things for them that He does for me. I'm serious. In other words, God's faithful. And if you don't believe that you can trust God, my friend, your alternative is to trust the arm of the flesh. You know, God can send a hailstorm or a hurricane or whatever else, and He can wipe out all your labor and all your work. Or He can send the early and the latter rain. I'd rather have the early and the latter rain. That's what God promised if they'd keep the Sabbath days. So Nehemiah, rightfully so, was very upset. He contended with the nobles. And guess what? Um, in verse 19... He came up with a solution. First of all, uh, let's see here. came to pass, verse 19, that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should be no burden be brought, that should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. Nehemiah took it upon himself to police things. He had Sabbath gate closers and burden bearer stoppers. <laughs> if you wanted to come in the gates selling something or carrying something, Nehemiah said, Get, city's closed. We're not doing business right now. It's a Sabbath. And you guess what happens, my friend? Whenever there is something that God commands, people always try to get around it, don't they? So here's the workaround. Look at verse 19. Uh, or verse 20. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. So what did they do? Well, they decided to just stay in Jerusalem and be there for the Sabbath day. That way they're not carrying things in. They just wanted to have everything set up. And uh, in verse 21, then I testified against them and said to them, why lodge you about the wall? I love the way Nehemiah says this. If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Now, he's not speaking of the ordination ceremony here. <laughs> From that time forth, they came they no more on the Sabbath. I admire Nehemiah in every way. Nehemiah is what a man ought to be. Because he's the kind of guy, I mean, honestly, I don't know how tall he was. I don't know how big his muscles were. But I'll tell you something about Nehemiah. If he told you he was going to do something, you kind of believed him. And so these guys are sneaking around trying to set up so that they can sell things on the Sabbath day. And he said, why are you doing this? If you do it again, I'm going to lay hands on you. And they quit doing it. <laughs> In other words, he gave consequences for wrongdoing. Recent years, I've heard Christians debating things like boycotts. Haven't you? Boycotts. Uh, the Southern Baptists used to boycott things. They boycott Disney when Disney started really promoting the homosexual movement. They quit boycotting Disney, and they should still Disney should just be, you know, boycotted permanently, in my opinion. Right, Brother Taj? I'm pretty sure Taj would absolutely we hate Disney. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they did boycott that. Uh, two years ago, was it that Doritos came out with these homosexual uh, chips, PepsiCo? And some Christians said, okay, we're not going to eat Doritos. And it really messes up this whole Taco Bell on Sunday thing for us. <laughs> uh, it's a tough one. Um, and uh, this, this uh, past week, a lot of people, not for necessarily spiritual reasons, but for national reasons, have decided they're going to boycott the National Football League. And, uh, you know, people debate well, whether that has any effect or whether it does anything. Well, actually, it, it kind of does. Uh, I, I'm going I'm to play the prophet for a moment. The NFL is going to reverse its stance on dis, disrespecting our country and our flag. The National Football League, in the next week or two, will back down from its stance. They'll, they'll say, well, it was just against the president, it wasn't against the country, but they will stop disrespecting our flag. I promise you, in the next couple of weeks, because it's going to cost them this. And have consequences. I wonder, though, Christians, you know, we think that uh, Christians shouldn't work on Sunday, don't we? 
Not because it's a Sabbath day, but because you ought to worship God. We started, didn't we, some years ago with the uh, well pastor. You have to understand that there are some things that, some jobs that don't stop on Sundays. For instance, if you work in the medical field, people still have medical needs on Sunday. You know, most two Christians who work on Sunday uh, don't work on Sunday because they have no choice. They work on Sunday because they're afraid that they won't be able to pay their bills if they don't. Or they think they can't get a better job. The fact of the matter is that there have always been enough heathens, enough pagans to work on the Lord's Day that we don't have to. I think it would be kind of good if we as believers would just dial back and rethink the whole shopping on Sunday thing. I know there's a Safeway next to the church, and when you come to church, it's really convenient to shop at Safeway. And I know if we're having a church activity, we need something, we go to the Safeway. But you know, when I was growing up, we actually didn't buy anything on Sunday. We got gas on Saturdays because most of the gas stations were closed. And when gas stations, I'm telling you, this is the, the era I grew up in. In the Midwest, on Sunday, if a, if a gas station, listen, if they did three things, if they sold dirty magazines, is what we called them, if they sold cigarettes, or if they were open on Sundays, we didn't patronize that gas station. My dad, there was a used car dealer, and the car dealers in our town had an agreement that no one would sell a car on Sunday, and if you sold a car on Sunday, you'd get blackballed by the rest of the dealers in town. I'm serious. This is, this is the age in which I grew up in. Uh, what's the best day of the week to have a restaurant business? Sunday. What's the best day of the week to sell a car? Yeah, the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Usually you make the deal on Saturday and pick it up on Sunday now. That's when most cars are sold. That's when most rest. You know what? Our country did pretty well back when that was kind of the way it was. But we don't think we can do that anymore. And the same Christians that say, well, you've got to understand, there are some jobs that have to be worked on Sundays. There are some things that have to be done. You know what? That's not a discussion anymore. That's just the slippery slope you start on before you slide on down. I've never been one to say it is absolutely wrong to get the oxen out of the ditch on, on, on the Lord's Day. The Bible provides for that. I understand that. I want to just tell you something. These people in Jerusalem or in Judah did not have to sell their wares on the Sabbath. It's just that there were a lot of people that weren't doing anything on the Sabbath and it was a good time to sell things. And they weren't willing to do the right thing, and so guess who made them do right? Nehemiah. You say, Pastor, America is not Israel. Well, I've never, I never thought it was. But I would actually like to be part of a nation that fears God. I don't care if it's... I don't care where I live. I want to live in a nation that fears God. I want to be a people that represent fearing God. Wouldn't you? And I think that a people that are having revival then would look at individual events, individual things, and say, okay, this is what God delivered us from. Let's not go back. And if any people in the world should know better than to buy and sell on the Sabbath day and to work on the Sabbath day, who in the world ought to know better than a people that have been in captivity because of it? It's amazing to me that people that struggle with drinking want to argue about you know, well, drinking's not bad, it's just excess. Or it's just some people that shouldn't drink, or it's just whatever. You're playing silly games, my friend. If God delivers you from something, you ought to just agree with God on it. Just believe God on it. And we as believers so many times are so inconsistent. I'm not preaching legalism here this evening. I'm not preaching, you know, that we have to obey or keep certain laws in order to have a relationship with God. I'm just telling you that somebody who knows God and knows what God's want, God wants lives and acts like they do. And acts as though God has had an effect on their thinking and on the way that they live. So there are just certain things that we as believers shouldn't do. There are certain things that we as believers ought to involve ourselves in. There are things that we shouldn't support and we ought to stand against. In some areas, I believe that it would help us, it would behoove us for Christians to speak out to embarrass other Christians. Let me, let me mention some of them, if you will, uh, tonight. Hollywood. You shouldn't support Hollywood, period. Period. You should not support Hollywood at all. Hollywood should never have a dime of your money. Period. 
that's it. I mean, that's that's the whole the whole uh, kit and caboodle, isn't it so? If anybody should withdraw their support of Hollywood, it ought to be Christians. If there's ever a place that hates God and that hates Christians, if there's ever a place or there's ever an industry that hates God and hates believers, God's people, it's Hollywood, and we shouldn't support it. Am I wrong? No. You know, if you're a Christian, you should never go to the movie theater, period. Punctuation mark, comma, exclamation point, question mark. You can have whatever uh, punctuation you like for it, but you should not ever go to the movie theater. So let me put it with a question mark. If you're a Christian, you should never go to the movie theater? No, you should never go to the movie theater if you're a Christian. Seriously. You know, that's a debate. <laughs> if Charlie or Tony posts this on YouTube, I'm going to get emails about it. With people that want to tell me that there's good in Hollywood or that it's wrong for Christians not to get involved with it. Don't bother emailing me about it. You know, <laughs> you don't have a leg to stand on. You don't support the wicked. There are Christians that think that it's in bad taste for us not to support the wicked. I'm serious. This is the argument. Well, Pastor, if we don't involve ourselves in the movies or in Hollywood, then we'll remove our influence from them. Yeah. We don't have an influence there anyway. They're influencing us. We're not influencing them. Okay, let me give you one more. I'm just making, I'm just, just throwing things out, okay? This is not some inspired list, but I think it's common sense. Public education. Public education. If you're here and you're a kid and your parents send you to public school, you don't have a choice about that. You need to pray and ask God for His grace. And uh, you need to do everything you can to try to get a Christian influence in it. If you're a teenager, you need to be starting a Bible study at your school and, and sponsoring Pastor Price to come preach to all your friends. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. We could do that. You need to do it. You do everything you can. You don't have a choice about it. But if you're a parent here tonight, you've got no business putting your kids under people who are going to steal their minds and their hearts and their souls. And that's precisely what the education system in almost every country, but I know in our country, is all about. They're anti-God. They're atheistic. At the very least agnostic. They mock and they attack the spiritual things. And they try to literally take out of you or stamp out of you or destroy any remnant of God. If you're a parent and you subject your children to educators that hate your God, you're just like the people who have been in captivity for 70 years who are buying and selling on the Sabbath day. You're nuts. I'm going to end with that. We don't have much more time this evening. But you know, as believers, we have to think through what we do. Um, i use one last illustration. I was talking to somebody today about the restaurant business, and I told him, you know, you should start a Chick-fil-A because they're not open on Sundays. Just think, I, you know, I think it's great, don't you? Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays. And uh, we actually go to Chick-fil-A some Wednesday nights. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't really care that much for Chick-fil-A. I, their, their chicken sandwiches are subpar. They're okay. I've never had a bad meal at Chick-fil-A. I've just never felt like I ate when I went to Chick-fil-A. I felt like I had a snack or an other or a sample or something like that. And I feel as though I paid for a meal, but I didn't get to eat. So after being at Chick-fil-A, I always go home and eat. I really do. So I'm not a major Chick-fil-A proponent, but, um, you know, I think we as believers ought to kind of patronize those things. People like Truett Cathy that uh, stood for righteousness, did right things, and has said, you know something, I'm, I believe that you shouldn't work on Sunday, and I'm going to trust God for it. And everybody said there's no way in the world you could make a living doing that. There's no way in the world you could be su successful doing that. And Chick-fil-A is the most successful fast food restaurant there is. There is no fast food restaurant that has the kind of ratings or reviews. Why do you think that is? Are we in Israel? Did God promise He'd bless Truett Cathy? 
He's the kind of God that blesses people that honor Him. See, God's blessed them. And that's a fact. I mean, he's, he's with the Lord today. But I just want to tell you something. The only way you can explain Chick-fil-A is just to simply say, God blessed them. It's the only way you can explain it. Because the fact of the matter is, is that they cut out of seven days, they cut the best sales day out. And all their competition was able to get a leg up on them on that day. And yet a lot of fast food restaurants are in trouble. Burger King's a godless franchise. They're anti-God, terrible franchise. And they're always struggling with bankruptcy and being bought out by somebody or other. God hasn't blessed Burger King. And I'll be honest with you, you think I'm being silly here tonight. I'm being a little bit funny, but the fact of the matter is I try not to eat at Burger King. I try not to eat there because I think they just they they, they are anti God. They're anti morals, they're anti family, they're anti everything I'm for. They hate me and I don't want to support them. And as believers, we need to say things like this. And we need to leave live things like this. You say, Pastor, you know what are you gonna think about me? If I tell you Burger King is my favorite restaurant, well, I'm going to think you probably like flame broiled hamburgers. So learn how to make your own or start a flame broiled hamburger restaurant that uh, closes on Sundays and it might be a smashing success. <laughs> That's all. Because God can bless you. You can honor God and God will take care of you. Isn't it so? Do you trust Him? Do you believe Him? See, that was the difference between Nehemiah and everyone around him. He knew God intimately well enough that he knew if, if God says we're going to be judged, then God's, God's right, and he's right to judge us, and he will because he's a good God. And if God says he'll bless us, then he's right, and he will because he's God, and I want God's blessing, not God's judgment, and I'm going to do everything that's necessary. <laughs> and I love what he says. He says, if you do this again, I'm going to lay hands on you. <laughs> I've said that to people before. I will lay hands on you. And, it, you know, it depends on who you are. Uh, you might have some effect. I'm not saying go out and threaten to assault unsaved people. But practice what you preach. Live what you preach. Exercise it. And I just, I just want to let you know that I'm in silent protest. No. Protest it. Do what you can be the kind of Christian that influences other Christians. Be the kind of Christian that's not a busybody, that's not mean-spirited, but when somebody says something that's wrong, when they're thinking wrong, that you challenge their thinking. We've lived in the political correct society so long that even believers don't think that it's right to challenge somebody's thinking. You're mean-spirited if you actually just tell somebody, show somebody what the Scripture says and say, you know what, here's what the Bible says, and it's not what you say, you're wrong. It's okay to tell a Christian they're wrong. Believe in the wrong. That's what we need. We got churches full of people who are afraid to say anything's bad about anything anywhere. And Nehemiah wouldn't have. <laughs> Nehemiah would have said, "Y'all doing that in this church? And if you do, I'll lay hands on you." <laughs> and so let's remember that the God that Nehemiah served is the God that we serve. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the principles that were true in Nehemiah's day can be believed and practiced every bit so much, as much today. Father, I pray that you'd help us to believe and to live what we say we believe. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take a moment and go over some prayer requests tonight.